Please take your Bibles, turning to Hebrews chapter 12, and I will begin reading at verse 18 down to the end of chapter 12. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those who did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. I am not sure that there was ever a time when my mom or my dad took me to the phone and said, now here is the proper way in which to answer a phone. There was no training or formal training in etiquette, but somewhere along the way, I learned that it was not quite right to pick up the receiver and to say, yeah, what do you want? that it was more proper to say, good morning, good afternoon, hello, may I help you, or uh, just to carry on the conversation. And that if there was some doubt about who was on the other end of the phone, of course, most of us know that our lives have been largely lived without caller display, that should there be some doubt about who was on the other end of the phone, that we don't say, and who in the world are you? That we say, may I ask who is calling, please? Phone etiquette. Here, smack in the middle of what we have just read is verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. And the title of the message, Who is Speaking? It is vitally important that we comprehend who it is who is addressing us and that we not have any cavalier or casual acquaintance with the Lord whereby we would say, you know what, that was just maybe a suggestion or that was maybe just a bit of helpful advice and we can take it or leave it. Here we have before us laid forth that we must not refuse him who is speaking because the one who is speaking, as it says in verse 29, is a consuming fire. How we love the portions of the Old Testament where, for instance, Elijah calls down fire from heaven on that sacrifice which was soaked absolutely dripping wet, and not only was the sacrifice consumed with the fire, but also all of the fire or the water that was in the trench round about. 
Then, as we read from 2 Kings in chapter 1, how that Elijah calls down fire upon the first 50 and 1 and the second 50 and 1 as they come in their arrogance to demand that Elijah adhere to the king's command, but that the third, because he comes humbly, not so much before Elijah, but before the God of Elijah, and his request is granted. How we love also that Moses, he stood in front of this bush that was burning and burning and burning, and yet it was not burnt up. Our God, repeatedly through the scriptures, Pentecost included, our God is figured, the image that is given is of blazing holiness and of a consuming fire, even as we have it here. As we have made our way into Hebrews chapter 12, we began with the altar call that we come and that we fix our eyes upon Jesus as we run the race that is set before us, we run it with endurance and that we consider what Christ has endured on our behalf, that we not lose heart, that we not grow faint. We also have heard that a father's discipline is meted out to us as a kindness. It is not a bullying old man who comes and meets out harsh discipline to us. It is a part of us knowing that we are children of God, that we are sons and daughters of an eternal kingdom, that we are citizens of glory when discipline comes our way, when trial and testing and hardship, we do not run from it, but we receive it understanding that God is our heavenly father, and that we receive this knowing he is working holiness, that he desires our sanctification. He is preparing us to dwell with him for all eternity. But now we also come as a reminder to see that here there is a contrast between two mountains. It's a little bit like Galatians, if you read there. Paul also he contrasts two mountains, but here we are told that we do not come to a mountain that can be touched and a blazing fire. We come to a mount of a different kind. But the imagery is rich. We think back to Exodus chapter 19 and chapter 20 when Moses, he is at the base of Mount Sinai about to go up and receive the Ten Commandments. But first of all, there were very definite stipulations that were to be announced in the camp of the Israelites. The people were not to approach the mountain, and even if an animal was to go near, it was to be stoned. Moses alone was to ascend. But not only was there that mountain standing in front of them, the people, they saw the fire, the darkness, and they heard and they sensed the whirlwind, they heard the blast of trumpet and words that were so freakish to them that they pleaded, Moses, you go. We're going to beat a retreat to our tents. You go and you deal with this. We are utterly undone by what we are sensing what we are hearing, what we are see seeing, what we are feeling in this moment. Moses, you go and you meet with God and you bring back to us. But Moses, lest we think of him as a towering figure, he himself declares, I am full of fear and trembling. Full of fear and trembling at such a sight. Those things live large in our imagination from the Old Testament. But verse 22 says, no, 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 you haven't come to the mount whereby the law was dictated down. 
you have come to a mount of a different kind. You have come to Mount Zion, city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, myriads of angels all about, and other descriptions to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect. How in those two verses there's got to be 50 sermons. But then, verse 24, and to Jesus. I tell you, the best is left for last. It's like dessert. Jesus, he is the one, the mediator of a new covenant, the one who has sprinkled blood which really does the job that needed to be done for each and every one of us. In the Old Testament, when the priests were to bring the sacrifice into the altar, many times they were to sprinkle blood upon the altar and then to turn and to sprinkle blood upon the worshipers. Jesus has done that, and it is what has truly cleansed us. So we have not come to some light show and some uh, amazing, dazzling concert of sensory overload. We have come to one who has loved us with an everlasting love and who reaches out who has been the means of bringing salvation for each and every one of us. And the word is, there's a natural consequence of everything that the Bible lays out for us. It isn't simply trivial information. There is a natural next step. And here it comes. Knowing that we haven't come to Mount Sinai, but rather to the very throne of God, that we, through Jesus Christ and our confident trust in Him, have come into wealth untold. See to it that you do not refuse Him who is speaking. Don't refuse Him. Sometimes the words are difficult to receive. It's like the words of the prophet. They received them into their mouth and it was like honey but it went down and it was bitter. Sometimes the ways of the Lord are exactly like that. But we are told, do not refuse him. You know his character. You know that he cares for you. You know that he has come from heaven to give his very lifeblood for us. Do not refuse understanding that he is working all of these things for our benefit, for our good. Now, at times the scripture speaks ever so gently and patiently, at times much more sternly. Here is a more stern word. We know that in the wilderness wanderings, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, many times they rebelled and they spoke against Moses and there were difficulties They said, let's go back to Egypt and forget about this whole big idea that Moses laid in front of us. Let's just forget it. We remember that it was only Joshua and Caleb, of all the adults who emerged from Egypt, only Joshua and Caleb were the ones who entered into the promised land. All of the others, there was a funeral held for them somewhere in the wilderness wanderings. Here we are told, those in the wilderness did not escape when they were warned on earth. Do you think that it makes sense that when we have a word of revelation, that we have someone speaking to us from the very throne of God rather than Moses, you know, standing on his podium, speaking to the people, if we have God speaking from heaven and warning us, how much less will we escape if we turn away? It does not make sense. It just doesn't add up. Then it goes on, and his voice shook the earth then, then, back in the Old Testament, how that the people trembled and couldn't help but trembling 
because everything around them was trembling. The earth was trembling, their tents were trembling, and their hearts were trembling for fear. They couldn't help it. God was shaking, but now God has promised yet once more. I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken. A divide is being made here, and it is that everything is going to be shaken, and some things in the shaking are going to shake to pieces. Those things which are temporal, those things which are not eternal, those things which are not durable in heaven's terms will shake to pieces. But there are those things which shall remain. There are some things which are not of this earth or not of this world. And so even with the shaking that God does, those things will remain. And upon those things we set our minds, we set our hearts, we set our affections, and we value them above all. Therefore, verse 28, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. Kingdom. Matthew was the gospel writer who, especially of the four, would hold out for us the thought of the kingdom, the Matthew records Jesus as coming and preaching of the kingdom. And if you have a kingdom, of course, you have a king. Here, we are told that we have a kingdom. We are not the king of that kingdom, but that kingdom is as much a part, as much ours as anyone else's. We have entered into the riches, and as children of God, we can call it our very own. We have received. It is not something that we anticipate. We have received it because delivery is so absolutely sure. We have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken. We have possessions which shall last for all eternity. And as a result of that, just like it says in verse 25, the natural outflow of what we have here, that we have come to Mount Zion rather than to Mount Sinai, don't refuse him who is speaking. Here also, we have a natural progression. Since we have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us, and those two words remind us of things that we have heard in Hebrews chapter 10 and at the beginning of chapter 12 as well. But here we have it, let us show gratitude. It is a strange thing for a believer in Christ to be grumpy, and grumbling, and constantly complaining, and not to be filled with gratitude, not only in October, but all the year long. It is only right that we show gratitude for what we have received, the kingdom that shall last for all time. Think of the kingdoms and the empires of this world. How far back can you go in your, in your historical mind? Think back to Egypt. Think back to Assyria. Think back to Babylon. Think back to the Medes and the Persians. Think back to the Greeks and to the Romans, to the Turks or the British or whoever you want to think of. Kingdoms that have risen, kingdoms that have in time, some quickly, some after a longer period of time, they have fallen. But the kingdom of which Jesus is king is a kingdom without end, and we are a part of it. And so these who were thinking, maybe, maybe we missed the mark, maybe we should draw back, maybe we had it all wrong, the word is, no, you didn't have it wrong. You have entered into privilege. You have entered into treasure beyond your wildest imagination. And the right response is 
thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And here also it is said, let us show gratitude by which gratitude leads us on to even more, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. And that reminds me of Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. Paul writing, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable, acceptable. That same word, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, perfect, the acceptable will of God. Let us show gratitude and may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. The Hebrews, they were being conformed to this world. The struggles, the hardships, the testings, that was having a molding effect upon them. And the word is no, 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 not conformity, but transformation, transformation. For our God indeed is a consuming fire, a consuming fire. Lord, we would come before you and with deep gratitude we would say thank you for all of your goodness to us. Lord, forgive us should in any situation, because we have tasted of all your kindness, that we ever take you for granted, that we overlook the riches of your word, we overlook the character of your person, the goodness of your great forgiveness to us. Lord, oh God, so work in us. May we remember that we are instructed to kiss the Son, lest he be angry with us. Lord, we have received so much. You have been so good to us. May we serve you with reverential fear and awe, not considering it strange, but realizing the privilege we have entered into. Hear us, O oh God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.